I was glad when they said in the meal, let us go into the house of the Lord. I know that you're still uh, finding your way, some of you to your seats. I'm so glad that you are here today. Uh, we may have guests with us today. If you are visiting with us today and uh, you're not a member here, uh, we would delight in you taking the visitor's card that you find in the pew rack in front of you and give us some information how we might contact you. We would like to do that, if nothing other than a letter or phone call. And we appreciate you being with us today. So if you would find that pew, uh, that uh, card in the pew rack and fill it out, we would very much appreciate that. And then as we receive our tithes and offerings later in the service, just drop that in the offering plate. And that would mean a lot to us today. It is good to be in the house of the Lord. This evening we will have our business meeting. And I hope that you understand that Christians come to business meeting. You know why? Because it's biblical. In the Bible, there were business meetings. They didn't, didn't call them that, but they were. So they're always important. Tonight we have a, a, a motion to make that will be very important about our custodial uh, situation. And so we uh, hope that you will be with us during that time, not only for a business meeting, but worship and being together. I want to ask now that you uh, bow with us in prayer as we look forward to worshiping the Lord. We've come here today not to be seen, but to see the Lord. Let's ask Him for His presence. Dear Father, we pray now that we may be able to forget about ourselves. It's good to have a good feeling about ourselves, but we pray, Father, that as we come into this room we call the sanctuary, that it may be just an extension of our lives out there being a sanctuary because you're with us wherever we go. And yet, Lord, you give us the privilege and indeed have called us to be in this place at this time. So, Father, already we realize that without the cross, we could not come and be in your presence. Without salvation and forgiveness of sins, paid for by your blood, shed for us, we would have no hope. Lord, we come to celebrate today those of us who have crossed over from death into life spiritually. We celebrate the hope that we do have. And now, Lord, we pray earnestly that you will be in our midst. You will speak to us through our singing and preaching and responding. For all is vain unless the power of the Spirit comes down. We need your instruction, Lord. We need your encouragement, O oh Father. We need even your chastening, O oh Lord, that we may follow you with joy and that we may be a family. We would love each other, love each other, that others may see your love in us and understand you are real. That is our prayer now, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would stand up and greet those around you.
The universe is full of mysteries, full of the unknown. This summer, kids will learn that the God who created everything there is, the knowable and the unknowable, the visible and the invisible, wants a relationship with them. Dust off your telescopes and get ready to show kids who mapped out the stars. Each day during Lifeways VBS, your galactic star bears will gather under the stars for high energy worship. Then it's off to the Star Bear Clubhouse for Bible study, where kids will focus their telescopes on the creator of the universe. Next, gravitate to fun under the stars and experience crafts, music, missions, and more. All this fun is centered around helping kids discover that the God who made the galaxies knows them by name. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for everything was created by Him in heaven and on earth. 
the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. This summer, shoot for the moon and include everyone in your galactic surveyor's adventure. Check out these resources available for students, adults, special needs, and Espanol. Remember, you can also take VBS to your own backyard with the Backyard Kids Club Kit. This summer, invite kids to the clubhouse and open their eyes to the God who is over the moon in love with them. Vacation Bible School is just around the corner, so I hope that you're making plans to, to be part of that. Work week is in just uh, two weeks, and, and we'll spend all week getting ready, getting things transformed around here, ready to, to have the kids the following week. And, and then that week, uh, obviously, uh, we, we need as much help as, as we can get. And so you can sign up, and I think there's a sign-up sheet in the foyer. You can also just kind of call the church office and let us know that you're willing to help because we would love to have as many of you help as possible. And so that's just around the corner. But the most important thing that you can start doing right now for Vacation Bible School is begin to pray. Begin to ask the Lord that he would prepare the hearts of all the different age students that will be here that week that they would be ready to receive the truth of his gospel and hopefully to respond in a positive way to that. So if you would, please, uh, please pray with us. We're going to have, uh, right now we're going to pray for Vacation Bible School and then we're going to move into worship. And so after we pray together, if you would, stand and worship with us. Lord, thank you so much for who you are. God, it's just so awe-inspiring to, to think that we're going to be teaching our children in just a few weeks about how you've placed every star in the sky and you know them by name. Lord, what a great promise that is for each and every one of us that there's no no individual, uh, whether how, how great in their own eyes or how small in their own eyes, that is uh, meaningless to you. Father, if you can call every star by name, you, you know each one of us and you know our hearts. Lord, we pray now that as you prepare leaders to step up and to work for Vacation Bible School, Lord, that you would just uh, anoint them, just call them to do that, and just use them in a very special way that week. Lord, we also pray for all the children and students that will be coming that week. Lord, that you would just uh, get their hearts and their minds ready to receive what it is that you have from that week. Lord, that as the gospel is presented into their lives, that if they need to respond to that gospel and accept you as Lord and Savior for the first time, God, that you would just do that work in their hearts. We trust you to know uh, that, that you can do that in, in every child's heart. And Lord, we just look forward and expect you to do great things. We love you. And we pray that you would continue to bless us this morning as we worship you through song and in just a, a few moments when we open your word to continue to worship you there. But we love you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would stand with us.
Father, we thank you that, that you are the Lamb, that you sent your Son to be the sacrifice for each and every one of our sins. Father, a debt that none of us could pay, you saw fit to send your Son to pay that for us. God, we just pray that, that as, as we praise you this morning, as we seek you this morning, Father, that you would teach us more about you today than we thought we could ever know. God, that you would call us into a relationship that's, that's deeper, that's more intimate with you than we thought imaginable. Father, this morning as we, 
as we sing one more song, Father, we're going we're gonna to cry it out. We're going to pray it to you this morning, Father, that you would give us one pure and holy passion. Father, that you would take all of the, the things in our life, all of the distractions that, that tend to get in our way from giving our heart wholly to you. Father, tonight we pray that, this morning we pray that that would be the cry of our hearts. Lord, give us one glorious ambition. Lord, that's to know and to follow hard after you. Look with me in the book of Proverbs. We're looking again. This will be our last of the series of Credible Christian Character. But we are looking today. We begin in Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 1 in a moment. And the idea is, is our human character lining up with our heavenly commitment? Do we have a commitment that appears to be real, both to us and those who do watch us. And there are those, indeed, who do watch us. If you've been with us the last few Sundays, kind of a review here, we talked about first how well we listen. That is a factor in whether we have genuine salvation. How well we make, use, and give money, then, is a second question. And then what we speak uh, about to others, uh, and who, uh, how we speak to others and about others. Whether we're honest last week, all the way through that area of integrity. Now let me tell you a story that will illustrate what you've probably already seen in your bulletin is the title today. And that is a story of myself uh, several years ago when uh, I was in my last full-time pastorate. And I was able to buy a used motorcycle. And uh, so that was really cool. I hadn't had a motorcycle in years. And so, man, I was, one Saturday morning I knew I had a haircut to go get. And I was all excited. I jumped on that thing, ran up and down the main drag of the town and through a few neighborhoods. And I noticed a lady named Mary, a church member, began following me. I said, wow, there's Mary. I can see her in the rearview mirror. And then I get to the barber shop, and Mary pulls up. And I say, hi, Mary. And she said, preacher, where is your helmet? <laughs> I said, I, she said, there are people watching you. There are other motorcyclists in town that are watching the pastor Ride around without a helmet. There are young people who are going to have motorcycles, and they're watching you without a helmet. I want you to have a helmet on. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Miss Mary. So today the question is, are you correctable? I wore my helmet 90% of the time after that. <laughs> are you correctable? It says we sure need to be, the Bible says, because in Proverbs 12 and verse 1 it says, Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge. That's the good side of that, but the latter part. But he who hates correction, the NIV says, is stupid. Now, surely the Bible doesn't really say that. Your Bible probably says is brutish. Uh, the King James Version and perhaps the New King, King James Version as well may say something else like that. But when you look up brutish, it means like a dumb ox. And so the NIV is pretty accurate. Those who will not receive correction show themselves to be stupid. Well, let's see what God's Word says about those who won't receive correction at first. We'll take a look at that. And those who won't receive correction, the first truth is that they reject the one giving correction. You've probably been on one side or the other of that, having others reject your desire to lovingly correct. No, don't talk to me. One way a mocker or a scorner rejects you when you try to correct him is insulting you. In Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 7 it says, whoever corrects a mocker invites insult. Most of us have been there sometime in our life when we tried to correct somebody and they're a mocker, a scorner. Leave me alone. What? I know what I'm doing. Well, at other times a mocker rejects your correction simply by not listening. Closed ears. A mocker does not listen to rebuke. Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 1. Well, those who don't receive correction also, thirdly, show themselves to be, we saw it a while ago, stupid. That's, you know, that's hard to say. But in that moment that we re will not receive correction, that we say, I know what I'm doing, we are playing the role of the brute, of the animal that will not be led. He who hates correction is stupid. We see it again. Proverbs chapter 1, the 12 in the latter part of verse 1. Now, we're not being stupid when we give people extra information they may not have had. Sometimes people may say, I, I am concerned. 
and they may share something. And we are able to say, well, I've not been able to share this, but you don't realize this situation. And they go, aha, well, now I understand. That's not being brutish. That's not being stupid. That's helping somebody understand. Or if, God forbid, we are falsely accused. I mean, just out of nowhere, out of left field, something that is a lie, untruth is said against us, a damaging accusation. We are not being brutish if we defend ourselves in a Christ-like way. But the Bible says that we are being stupid if we refuse correction, especially from those who want to help us by correcting us. When we are too proud to admit we're wrong, we are just too proud. And that's just plain dumb. That's what the Bible says. Well, a third way that we have a difficulty with correction is that it leads others astray. Whoever ignores correction leads others astray. Now, if you have the King James Version or the New King James Version that says, he who refuses correction goes astray. But that Hebrew verb there can be either goes or leads, and both are true. If we do not heed correction, first of all, we go astray. But as we go astray, we lead others astray with us. And that's what Mary was concerned about. I was going astray, but my example was leading others astray as well. A dangerous thing to have others follow our example in a wrong direction. We need to be correctable. But let's turn the corner and look at the good things in store for those who will receive correction. For those who will receive correction, they are blessed as they show themselves to be wise. We all want to be considered to be wise. Proverbs 12, 15 says, A wise man, a wise woman, a wise teenager, a wise child listens to advice. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 8, the latter part of that, even says, A a wise man will allow you to give him or her a stern rebuke. Proverbs 9, 8, Rebuke a wise man, and he will love you. Isn't that amazing? A wise person will receive strong rebuke and love you for it. When I was a prison chaplain in my last tour of duty, (laughs) the last prison where I was a chaplain, uh, we had a faith-based barracks. We've been been able the last several years to have faith-based barracks in the Department of Corrections. And with faith-based barracks, we had a volunteer chaplain who would be up there a lot of the time. I was the main chaplain there. I was not able to be in the faith-based barracks all the time but we always tried to have a volunteer chaplain there. And then we had inmates who really showed themselves to be dependable, dependable, and they were like the barracks coaches. Well, I had a guy up there who had the spiritual gift of mercy. I mean, this guy was merciful, and I loved him dearly. But he was so merciful that when the character coaches would, would get on to the guys who were breaking the barracks rules, they would go see this volunteer chaplain and he would say, oh, that's okay, that's okay. And so the, the character coaches were coming to me and saying, Chaplain, you've got to do something. They're not listening to us because they keep going to your volunteer chaplain and getting off the hook. We really can't have order around here. And I had to get this, this guy down who I dearly loved, a great friend of mine, and say to him, Brother, uh, I need for you to, to not do I, I love your ministry of, of mercy that you're so loving you care about these guys. But I've got to let you ask you not to... Uh, let down your guard. And I'll never forget, he looked at me and said, Oh, Ross, thank you for sharing that with me. I needed to hear that. I tell you, that was a wise man. And I appreciated him so much. Well, in addition to showing wisdom, Proverbs says people who are correctable also show prudence. Not a word we hear all the time. Prudence is the ability to govern oneself by using reason, by using our heads. Prudence means that I don't just use my emotions. I don't automatically launch out with what I see. I wonder, is there something behind what I see? Often what we see is the truth. It actually is the whole picture. But we don't always know that. And the Bible says, A fool spurns his father's discipline, but whoever heeds correction shows prudence. Able to govern ourselves and our actions by using our minds. One of the things I remember, I don't know why I remember this one time, because my father gave me a lot of advice. 
And I just praise God for my father for teaching me some good things. One of the things that he told me one day, it was a Saturday morning, I remember that, I was back in his bedroom, we were getting ready to start the day, and he talked to me about objectivity. He said, we need to make sure, I probably was 11 years old or somewhere along there, we need to make sure that we really see both sides, that we really understand. What he was teaching me was prudence, prudence. And those who will receive correction grow in prudence. Along with wisdom and prudence, those who are correctable also gain what the Bible says is understanding. Proverbs 15 and verse 32, whoever heeds correction gains understanding. What's the Bible mean there by understanding? It means that which grows us. Those who heed correction grow spiritually, grow in maturity. We will receive correction and understand it and learn and not do the same thing again, not have the same behavior again. See, the Lord likes to grow us by putting us into situations (laughs) where we can't do it without growing because He's interested in growing our character and growing us in all the ways that are important to Him. And we gain understanding as we grow, as we receive correction. Well, we've heard about the pitfalls of not receiving correction. We've heard about the positive things that can happen to us when we are correctable. Now there remains just one question for us. Are we letting God's Word correct us? Are we? Are we consistently letting God's Word correct us? I remember memorizing as a child, 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So let's ask ourselves, how would God's word speak to us today? Three things. You see them in your outline if you're following along. Are we really changing as God wants us to change? Or are we refusing to change? Both individually we would ask that question. And as a church, are we changing as God wants us to change? Or are we refusing to change? Jesus said in Matthew 9 verse 17, this is a paraphrase, New wine cannot be poured into old wineskins. It must be poured into new wineskins. And here's a truth we need to hear. When a church values its comfort more than its cross, its tradition more than its transformation being changed by the Lord, its riches more than revival, its luxuries more than the lost, then it becomes a dead institution rather than a living movement. That ought to speak to us individually and as a body of Christ that good churches can begin to say, I'm not changing anymore. I'm not listening to correction. I'm not looking into God's Word to continue to have spiritual life. I'm just kind of coming and filling a pew. And after a while, we become an institution rather than a movement. Christianity was never meant to be an institution. It has always been a movement. And we look at some of the other movements in our land and wonder, why do they have so much energy? They're ungodly. Because they're not institutionalized, because they are flexible, because they can change, because, like it or not, maybe some of them are correctable. We also must be correctable. Are we correctable when God calls for new wine and old wineskins? Secondly, are we forgiving or are we withholding forgiveness? If you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Speaking to believers, speaking to those following Him, if you do not forgive, you will not receive forgiveness. Matthew 6, 15. Are we correctable when Jesus calls us to forgive? Then are we focusing on deeds rather than focusing on devotion? Because as we enter into the Christian life, somebody will sooner or later ask us to do this or do that, and that's good. It's wonderful to serve. We love to serve. But after a while, the wheels of serving begin to spin. And sometimes with that, the wheels of devotion slow down. 
Isn't it interesting that the great commandment, the greatest commandment of all, to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, comes before the great commission in the gospel of Matthew? Why is that? Because if we don't love God fully and completely, we'll never love others sacrificially. We need to come back to devotion. Being comes before doing. Always, always. Being, who we are before Christ, <clears throat> excuse me, comes before what we do. What we do is important. We enjoy it. We appreciate the opportunity. God blesses it as we stay close to Him. But the question is focusing on devotion. On devotion. You see, being correctable, you know this, this is first grade. Being correctable means being willing to admit when we are wrong. Oh, how that's tough sometimes, even for good believers. Being willing to admit we were wrong and let God change our attitudes and our actions. Going before Him saying, Lord, I thought I was on the right road, or maybe I knew I wasn't. But Lord, I turn back to you. I repent. I ask for your forgiveness. And then perhaps we go to someone else and share. I was wrong. May not have been wrong about everything, but I was wrong significantly enough that I need to ask for your forgiveness or help you to understand where I erred. Are you correctable? If not, or not as much as you want to be, the Bible gives a wonderful promise in Acts 3.19. Repent. That's what you have to do. Repent and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. And notice the last part of that. That times of refreshing may come from the Lord. I, I wish my spiritual life was alive like some others I see. I wish it was like it once was. Well, the, the dampening of that may come as you have said no or later to a call of the Lord, a quickening of the Spirit, a message perhaps like this, or maybe in a Sunday school class. And the Lord has said, come back near to me. Humble your heart. And don't be afraid to humble your heart. You're never more noble. You're never more adult. You're never more wise. You're never more godly. You're never more esteemed by me than when you are on your knees in repentance and humility. And when you do, times of refreshing. Oh, I love to hear that. Times of refreshing come to the church. Times of refreshing come to your area of the body of Christ. Times of refreshing come to our worship and our fellowship and our outreach. Even the ministries we do that sometimes we have to admit don't seem to have much life anymore. Oh, Lord, send us times of refreshing. Oh, Christian, correct your ways. May we bow together in prayer. In a moment as we do sing, it is always every time we gather, not the time just to hear truth, but it always is time to decide. It always is a time to open our hearts. And if the Lord speaks to you today about a decision that you need to make, changing this attitude, changing this action, going to someone, speaking, receiving someone else's overture toward you that you've rebuffed, I don't know what it is, but I want to invite you today I want to invite you today to leave this place knowing that you have been an obedient man, woman, young person. You have been obedient. You walk out of this place and say, hey, times of refreshing in my faith are here and are coming. The moment after I pray and as we sing, if the Lord so leads you, you may come and pray at these prayer altars about your decision or some other situation you have. You may come take my hand and say, Pastor, I need your prayer. Someone today may need to come to faith in Christ and receive Christ as Savior. Following baptism and church membership, you may come and take my hand and take that journey that God wants you to take. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, 
We have not gathered in vain. We are not here by accident. Father, I pray that we may be obedient unto you. That times of refreshing may be our joy and your joy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stand and sing as we wait upon the Lord.